Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Before I begin, the, this rain reminded me of a joke. There was a, in Arabia, there's a Khoja, we call him Khoja or uh, Jihi. And it was starting to rain. And his neighbor, he says to him, Why are you running away from the rain? Isn't it Allah's blessing? You should stay under the rain, get Allah's blessing. And the Khoja said to him, I don't want to step on Allah's blessing. <laughs> if you know the joke, that you can laugh. If you didn't get it, that's fine. You can laugh at me. <laughs> Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. In Alhamdulillah, in Ahmaduhu, and Astainu, and Astaghfiruhu, when I would be lay him in Shururi and Fusina, was a yati Amalina, may he did lahu fella, modilla lahu, and may you'd live fella, her dear lah. وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وصحبه ومن سار على نهجه إلى يوم الدين أما بعد فإن أصدق الحديث كتاب الله وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة في هذا الدين بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار all praise is due to Allah, <clears throat> the Almighty. We praise Him and seek refuge in Him. And we seek refuge from the shaitan and from the evil of ourselves. And from the evil of our actions. Whomever Allah guides, no one can mislead them. And whomever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala lets, to be misled, no one can guide them. And I bear witness that there is only one God, Allah, worthy of worship, and that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is his final messenger and prophet. May his prayers and blessings be unto him and unto his family and unto his companions and all of those who follow him in righteousness till the last hour. As to what follows, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam did say, the worst of all matters are the matters that are newly invented and made part of this religion. Any matter which is newly invented and made as part of this religion which did not belong to it at the time of the Prophet ﷺ is an innovation. And every innovation into this deen is a wrong path. And every wrong path leads to hellfire. My brothers and sisters in Islam, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Once again, Allah has willed it that we meet together here in this blessed evening in which I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us His mercy and blessings and reward us and reward you for your intentions. I am wallahi impressed and pleased that regardless of the intense weather tonight you made the effort and the jihad to come here may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward you and make your life successful for your great intentions inni uhibbukum fillah I love you in the cause of Allah you have chosen to come here tonight even though I know of many people back in Australia who would probably have resorted to stay back at home tonight and just get this lecture later on on the DVD. Alhamdulillah, I have come to Sri Lanka not to know a Muslim people who are lazy. You are not lazy people, inshallah. And a lot of the times, a lot of you have asked me to make dua for you. I don't think I've been anywhere where I've met so many people who have asked me to make dua for them. First of all, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward you for assuming so highly of me. But as Allah is my witness, and Allah knows best, He is the only one who knows who is better than anyone else. I may have impressed you with my manner of speech with my ability to speak well. 
I may have impressed you with the smiles that I have or the look that I have on the outside. But only Allah knows that maybe you are far better than me. And Allah knows that it could be that I am the one who needs your dua more than what you need my dua. Ali radiallahu anhu used to say when he was praised, O oh Allah, do not hold me accountable for the praises they give me. And I ask you to forgive me from the secrets which they do not know about me. And I ask you to make me better than what they think of me. So I ask Allah this. Imam Ahmed as well, Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal rahmatullahi alayhi, was approached by a man whose mother was very ill and she was crippled, she couldn't walk. So he went to Imam Ahmed and said to him, Ya Imam, please make dua for my mother to cure her. Imam Ahmed was disappointed. He said to him, I am disappointed. What makes you think that my dua is more important than yours? What makes you think that I don't need your dua? So the man thought that Imam Ahmed doesn't want to make dua, he left. But when he reached his home, he found his mother, she had been cured and walking. Imam Ahmed had made dua for her. But the point of that is, how do I know? I need your dua more than what you need mine. So I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala first to accept your dua and secondly, you do not forget me in your dua brothers and sisters in Islam. Our topic tonight, and this is our last lecture, sadly, I will miss you. Tonight is dedicated to the youth of Islam. Tonight is a dedication for the young hearts, the strength, the backbone, the heart of this ummah. They are the heart of this ummah and the backbone of this ummah. They are the strength of this ummah. Wallahi, they are the ones deserving of our attention. They are the emblems of this ummah, the ones whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has placed this deen on their shoulders. The future of this ummah, the young people, the youth among our brothers and the youth among our sisters. And wallahi, thumma wallahi, I do not make any preference of the brothers, young brothers, to our young sisters, nor do I not make preference to our young sisters, to our young brothers. You are equally important, Wallahi Azim. Our young brothers cannot go forward without our young sisters, and our young sisters cannot go forward without our young brothers. And equally, I do not isolate the elders. For our elders are our, our, our elders are our wisdom and you are our guide light. You have the experience, my brothers and sisters, our elders I am talking to. And our youth have the energy. All of us, we make one body, we make one ummah. And we all need each other. Like a jigsaw puzzle, each one has its different shape. But when you put it together, it makes a beautiful outcome, a full body. We are a body. My brothers and sisters in Islam, and especially the young ones, may I begin by asking, whoever is under the age of 40, please put your hand up. MashaAllah. Allahu Akbar, MashaAllah. I wish if the camera could have taken a little bit of a shot of that. Can I ask the people under 40, can you? People under 40, please put your hand up. We only have the men here to see, and I'm sure a lot of our sisters up there. So you can see, MashaAllah, we have this zeal, this energy who has come in this weather outside, not afraid of the lightning, not afraid of the thunder, not afraid of being soaked, but if they have come here, Alhamdulillah. And this is what I mean. The strength of this ummah is in the young generation without belittling our older generation. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala praises the young generation and he brought their mention in the Quran in Surah Al-Kahf Allah says innahum fityatun amanu bi rabbihim wa zidnahum huda 
وربطنا على قلوبهم إذ قالوا ربنا رب السماوات والأرض لن ندعو من دونه إلها لن ندعو من دونه إلها لقد قلنا إذا شططا Allah says they were truly young men they believed in their Lord with strength and we gave them more strength in their Iman, in their guidance, by guiding them. And we strengthened their hearts. When they stood up in front of all odds, when they stood up in front of all odds, when they stood up in front of all those who opposed them in evil, and they said with strength and firmness, our Lord is Allah. We will never call upon anyone beside Him with Him. He is the Lord of the heavens and the earth. We have said this with firmness. These are the young men of the cave in Surah Al Kahf. You know what I'm talking about, brothers and sisters. For Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to mention. These young men in Surah Al-Kahf to be recited on the tongues of every person to the last hour means that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala considers the youth of utmost, utmost, utmost importance. Brothers and sisters, I kid you not. And I'm not saying this just to try and trick the young people, thinking that the young minds are easily tricked. The young minds are not easily tricked. The young minds are full of firmness. All they need to do is to find two things. They need to know who is Allah to them? Who is their Lord? Who are they working for? Who is their role model? Who is their goal? Who are they serving? Who? And He is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And secondly, who are your role models in life among the humans? And they are the prophets of Allah, the companions of the prophets, and the first three generations after the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, in the Sahih Hadith in Bukhari, Khayrul Quruni Qarni, the best of all generations are my generation. Thumma alladheena yalunahum, then the ones who follow them after that second generation, then the third generation after them. Brothers and sisters, have you read about those three generations? Do you know what age group the majority of these three generations were, which the Prophet ﷺ is praising so much? Wallahi, more than 80% of these three generations which the Prophet ﷺ is talking about did not exceed the age of 30 to 35, 80% of them. And the majority of the companions whom the Prophet ﷺ says they are the best of all generations, they are the ones who are around the Messenger ﷺ. All of them and the majority of them were under the age of 30. In fact, more than 50% of them were between the ages of 15, 15 and 25. Hudayfa, Hudayfa, and Hudayfa ibn al-Yaman radiallahu anhuma, Sa'd ibn Abi Waqqas, Sa'id ibn al Sa'id radiallahu anhu and Sa'd, Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu anhuma, Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anhuma, Zayd ibn Haritha, Abu Jundub al-Ansari. I can keep counting and counting and counting. Hudayf ibn al-Yaman, Mu'adh ibn Jabal, Ali radiyallahu anhu, Uthman ibn Affan radiyallahu anhu, under the age of 30 at that time. And many and many, Abu Huraira radiyallahu anhu, Sa'd ibn Abi Waqqas radiyallahu anhu, Az-Zubayr ibn al-Awam radiyallahu anhu, Asma bint Abi Bakr radiyallahu anha, Aisha radiyallahu anha, 
نسيبة خولة رضي الله عنهن أجمعين I can keep counting on and on these were all youth around the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam once a man a alim came to Imam Malik radiyallahu arhamatullahi alayhi radiyallahu anhum ajma'in and he said to him let us talk about rijalul hadith the men of hadith you know what that means right the hadith that we quote they are narrated by the noblest of the noblest of people who heard it from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam or heard it from the people who heard it from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and there were over 100,000. Imam Malik said to him, leave that aside. Everybody talks about Rijal al-Hadith. There are so many of them. And most of them are young. You know why they were young? Because they had to have good memory. And we all know when you're younger, memory is better. Yes, we all agree. Elders, we agree. I'm now 35 and I feel the, my memory loss starting. So they are under 35, Rijal, more than 100,000 who brought us this deen. Imam Malik said, leave alone the men of hadith and let's sit down and talk about Nisa'ul hadith, the women of hadith. Everybody says Rijal hadith. What about Nisa'ul hadith? And he counted just by sitting there more than 10,000 of the women of hadith with their lineage with their characteristics he knew everything about them they are in the books of al-jarah wa ta'deel they are the books which tell us about the narrators of hadith so my brothers and sisters i'm just making this point emphasizing because we have sisters here alhamdulillah and i want to include them i want them to know that they play a huge role in the success of this ummah let me add one more thing before I get into my topic and get the ball rolling as they say. Just a little bit more emphasis, I want to include our sisters among the young men in this struggle, in, this, in the cause of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Do you know who is behind the great Imams Malik, Shafi'i and Ahmad ibn Hanbal among many others? Do you know who are the great ones behind them? Do you know how they became the great Imams of all time uh, after the Tabi'een? It was their mothers. Do you know how old their mothers were? They were not more than 30 years old. Do you know how old Imam Ahmad's mother was when she subjected him to the education and knowledge? She was 18 years of age. 18. She was a widow. Widow. And she said to her son, Ahmad, learn the character. Learn the adab of your teacher before you learn his knowledge. Imam Malik, his mother was below 30. When she took him herself to the Masjid al-Nabawi, and she chose for him his teacher, Rabi'at al-Ra'i, Imam Malik was 10 years old. How old was he? 10. And he had memorized the Quran. And she said to him, learn from Rabi'ah his character before you learn his knowledge. She was the inspiration. Do you know what Imam Malik wanted to become before he became a scholar? And scholar is an under, understatement. Before he became a allama, an, an emblem of knowledge. He wanted to become a singer. Do you know what it to become? A singer. Because he had a nice voice and he used to sing. So he, and he was very good looking. He came to his mother and his mother said to him, Son, you want to become a singer? That's fine. But let me warn you about something. I want to inform you how young women had the, they were the, they were the drive, the turning point of these great Imams. She said to him, if you want to become a singer, that's good. But there's a problem. Singing comes with good looks. And you don't have it. 
And that deterred him away from that to become Imam Malik as we know him. Imam Shafi'i's mother, under the age of 30, she took him from Mecca and sent him to Medina to learn of the great Imam Malik. She taught him the Quran at the age of seven, memorized it all. And he memorized Al Muwatta for Imam Malik at the age of 10 or 12. And he was a poet at the age of 11. She was his inspiration as well. So I want to include our sisters in this. And I want the young men to understand that when you get married, insha'Allah, to take good care of your wives. Because what you are taking care of is not just a woman. You are actually preparing a generation to come. The mother, as the poet in Arabic says, الأم مدرسة إذا أعددتها أعددت شعبا طيب الأعراقي The mother is an educational institution on her own. She is a school, a university. If you look after her and prepare her, you would have prepared a whole generation to come of youth full of great character and morals, full of leadership. And you know, uh, we always complain that women talk too much. Am I right? Yes? Dare I ask the men to put their hands up if they agree with me? It's scientifically proven. I'll just give you that. I'll save you. I can see some of the brothers afraid to put their hands up because they get caught on camera and their wives will see them upstairs. <laughs> have to go back home and pay for it. <laughs> okay. I'll give you your excuse from now, insha'Allah. Scientifically proven, it is the nature of women that they talk more than men. In fact, they made statistics that they talk about 24,000 words a day. And men talk between 9,000 to 14,000 on average. So that gives you when the young brothers, if you want to get married, I'm giving you a hint, a head start, insha'Allah. You go and work and you come back home. If you've already used up your 14,000 words, You've still got another 10,000 to go. You have to listen. And I'll give you some advice, insha'Allah, for the newly wedded ones, insha'Allah. So, why do they talk so much? There is a wisdom behind that. Children, children. It's not easy for them, children under the age of 10, it's not easy for them to understand something very quickly. They need to be spoon-fed. Do you agree with me? Those of you who are parents. Children need to be spoon-fed. So they require more words to explain things. Me as a father, I know this. If I come to explain my son or daughter something, I can't be bothered to explain too much. I choose minimal words which have big meaning. And if he doesn't get it from the first or second time, I get frustrated. I say, go to your mother. But the mother keeps going on and on and on and on and on and the child asks a thousand questions. <laughs> I say, explain to him, I'll be the introduction, you be the body and then I'll be the conclusion. Bring him when you want me to make a conclusion. So Alhamdulillah, this is why. Let us not ridicule and look down upon them. You know what? Please excuse me, I made this introduction including our sisters because it is very, very important. It is vital. It is vital, brothers, that our sisters are with us in this pathway in the cause of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if it wasn't for people like, women like Aisha radiallahu anha and Khadija radiallahu anha, who were role models for not only women but for men, you think this whole deen would have reached us in its completeness that it did with the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Aisha radiallahu anha, you know how many of the scholars she taught among the companions of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? More than 1,000 who narrated hadiths from Aisha radiallahu anha. If you recite, you look in Bukhari and Muslim, Tirmidhi, you'll find how many hadiths are narrated by Aisha radiallahu anha, in the hundreds. And these were men who heard them from her. 
if we do not include them, then how can we be a civilization? The West, the West, the Western world after World War I, they wanted to change the woman from a woman who raises the children from a woman who is educated and uses her education in the pathway of her children to make her a commodity and that if she has education to use it in the outside world to benefit big businessmen and entrepreneurs in the world of capitalism. So now they, they, in the West they draw the woman from being a wife, a mother, from being a person of education and if she is a person of, of, of education they take her out of the home to neglect the children in order to use her energy to build the outside world for the man. This is a trick, my brothers and sisters. I encourage our sisters and our brothers to become educated, but to be careful what kind of knowledge they learn. At the same time, where will you, where will you use this education? Where will you use your skills? The best place to use them is in your family. And the best place to use them is within your community. And I say to my sisters, the best good that you can ever do with your education, with your skills, with your energy, with the power which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you, is to raise a human being. To raise a human being. Not to raise skyscrapers. Raise a human being. And the fathers, the brothers, are the protection. They're the defense. They're the maintainers. They're the caretakers. They're the ones who monitor and maintain this woman, these children, this family, this household. We as men, if you like, if you want me to put it in simple words, we are the external affairs. And the women, our sisters are the internal affairs. They produce, we provide the means. The men provide the means and bring in and the women produce. And watch what they can produce, mashaAllah, if you give her that opportunity. I am surprised and I'm sorry for saying this if it may offend some people but I say it from the bottom of my heart. In Australia there are times where I go places to give lectures or durus and I'm disappointed that our sisters are not included. So we see beautiful, we see young men, mashaAllah, but my brothers, we cannot do it without our sisters. Because the mothers spend more times than the fathers with their children at home. And we want educated sisters in Islam and even in secular education to a certain extent. Halal education in the proper way, of course, in the halal way. And I'd rather my wife be the one who teaches my children than my children learning it from the TV or from the internet, or from their friends who I don't know, or from teachers who I don't know what their religious background is, and I don't know what their passion is, and I don't know what their agenda is. Don't you agree with me? Don't you want your children to be raised in that? Insha'Allah. The youth of Islam. One of the greatest stories one of the greatest role models of the youth that comes to us in the Quran is the Prophet Yusuf alayhi salam. Prophet Yusuf alayhi salam has a whole surah dedicated to him. This shows us how important the young Yusuf alayhi salam is to the youth. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about the story of Yusuf alayhi salam, in the whole of the surah, he focuses, subhana, he focuses our attention on a particular segment of his life. The segment of his life which the whole of the surah Yusuf focuses on is the life of his youth. The life of his youth. To the point where, he, where we hear about his father and mother coming to the throne when he was almost the king and they bowed to him and the story ends there he was under the age of 40 years and all that story in between was from when he was about seven or eight and most of it focuses on when he was between the ages 
of 16, 17 till about 30 years of age. That whole sort of focuses on that time. So I urge my young brothers and sisters to read Surat Yusuf and to understand it over and over and over again. Allah gives us a lesson for the youth. Allah tells us about Yusuf alayhi salam in the beginning. وَلَمَّا بَلَغَ أَشُدَّهُ آتَيْنَاهُ حُكْمًا وَعِلْمًا وَكَذَلِكَ نَجْزِ الْمُحْسِنِينَ And when Yusuf alayhi salam reached his adolescence, his strong youth, we gave him immediately حكمة, حكم, wisdom, and knowledge. Listen carefully, brothers and sisters. We gave him wisdom and knowledge. There is a difference between wisdom and knowledge. You can go to university. You can learn so much information. You can get your masters and doctorates in information, in knowledge. You can write books and books and books. But knowledge without wisdom is nothing. Nothing. And wisdom cannot be learned or taught at school. Wisdom is learned through training. Wisdom is morals, values, character, adab. Just like the mothers of these great four Imams taught them, they said, learn the adab from your teacher before you learn his knowledge. We hear about many people who have lots of knowledge, but they are criminals. What are they? Criminals. They are con artists. Con artists. Like people who hack into security systems on the computer. They are brains. They call them nerds, but they are called criminal nerds, cool nerds. They have a lot of information, remarkable knowledge. They are hackers, con artists, thieves. They have lots of knowledge, but they have no wisdom. So the first thing among the youth, which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brings our attention to, is wisdom and then knowledge. In fact, he put wisdom before knowledge when he said, We gave Yusuf wisdom and knowledge so wisdom came before knowledge wisdom is when you are able to communicate with someone and bring a change wisdom is when there is a conflict between two people you are able to reconcile between them with a few words wisdom is when someone opposes you with an idea or a view you are able to win their hearts and their minds with a few words, with a few characteristics. Wisdom is when you are able to transform an enemy into an ally. Wisdom is when you are able to make someone who hates you love you or respect you without even working hard for it, without needing to go into a a group of, of some sort or a gang of some sort wisdom is when you are able to have an elderly person listen to your words without the elderly person feeling that he is be, he or she is being disrespected by you this is wisdom being able to say what to say at the right time and not just saying everything and anything the opposite of wisdom is going on the internet. The opposite of wisdom is going on the internet and creating for yourself a username so no one knows who you are and a profile of some sort and then cutting and pasting pieces of information from different sources and making fatwas left, right and center and you don't even know what you are saying because it's easy to cut and paste 
And because you're hiding behind the username, it's easy for you to speak and talk and throw things without thinking about their ramifications. And this is done so often on the internet. We are going to address these issues tonight, inshallah. أَتَيْنَاهُ حُكْمًا وَعِلْمًا We gave him wisdom and knowledge. What happened to him? Then Allah, immediately after that, He mentions something. He says, وَكَذَلِكَ نَجْزِ الْمُحْسِنِينَ And this is how we reward the good doers. A young person cannot receive wisdom and knowledge without doing good in his community or her community without doing good in their family, without exerting ihsan. Muhsin literally means someone who works with the consciousness as if, Allah, as if he can see Allah. But although you cannot see Allah, you know that Allah can see you. Ihsan. أَن تَعْبُدَ اللَّهَ كَأَنَّكَ تَرَاهُ فَإِن لَمْ تَكُنْ تَرَاهُ فَإِنَّهُ يَرَاكُ To worship Allah as if you can see Him. But although you cannot see him, you know that he sees you. It is amazing how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions about Yusuf alayhi salam, Ashuddahu, when he was 17, 18 years old, saying we gave him wisdom and knowledge. And the reason why we gave him wisdom and knowledge is because he is among the people who are muhsineen, al-ihsan. He worships Allah as if he can see him. Although he cannot see him, he knows that Allah can see Yusuf. Many young people ask me, they say, how can I increase my iman? How can I stay away from haram? Many parents, they ask me, they say, my son, my daughter, they go into, they hide in their bedroom behind the computer and I don't know what they do. I don't know who their friends are. They learn certain tricks. You know, I come into the bedroom and suddenly the screen changes. I don't know what they did with this new technology. I don't know how to use it. They know how to hide things. And I think that, and then they change the page like this. To a website about Islam, for example. Or a website, one brother said to me, he goes, I entered the bedroom and suddenly my daughter changed the screen, went flip like that, flip. Because I've never learned this. I never knew that a screen can be flipped like that without doing this. It just flips. And what was it? How to be a respectful daughter. <laughs> Subhanallah. He says, I don't know what to do. What do I do, brother? I say to them, sadly, you are limited. There's only so much a parent can do. You, the reality is, you cannot watch them 24-7. But we can instill in our children something from a very young age. That although... I cannot see you 24-7. Your mother cannot see you 24-7. There is someone who sees you, not only 24-7, but also knows you better than what you know yourself. And is closer to you than your own jugular vein in his knowledge. He knows what you are feeling. He knows what you are thinking. He knows what you are planning. He knows the things that you are going to plan before you plan them. He is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he has placed two angels, one on the right, one on the left, Raqib and Atid. They are watching every move. Not a single word does he or she utter, whisper, except that there are two angels, two watchers and witnesses, writing every single word, every single letter. So there is a watcher over you. And the young people need to understand that the thing which prevented Yusuf alayhi salam from harm is that he had ihsan, that he knew that Allah watches him all the time. Muraqabatullah. You know the story of a young boy named... Uh, Uh, I think his name was uh, Suhail. He was only seven or eight years old. I think it was a tabi'a tabi'i. 
And he went to the masjid where they used to get knowledge of the Imam. The Imam noticed in this young boy an extreme intelligence. So one day he gave him extra attention. So the parents started to complain. How come you give this Suhail better attention? And it says that he gave them, each one of them, a bird. And he said to them, go and let this bird free. But you have to go to a place where no one can see you. You know, tell these stories to your children. You know, they make sense to them. And everybody went. After a few moments, the children came back, except for Suhail. At sunset, Suhail came back and the bird was still with him and he was crying. And the Imam said, why are you crying and why is the bird still with you? He said, Ya Imam, my uncle taught me some words and they don't leave me. Allahu shahidi, Allahu nadhiri, Allahu ma'i. Allah watches me, Allah is my witness, Allah is with me wherever I go. And you said, let this bird go where no one can see me. I went everywhere. I went up the tree, I hid behind things, I went behind the rock, I went everywhere. But everywhere I went, I knew that Allah is watching me, seeing me and is with me. So how can you ask me to let this bird go? I brought it back. And so he let it go afterwards. Young children need to have this instilled in them, that Allah watches you and is with you wherever you are. He is with you in his knowledge, wherever you are. And if the fear of Allah is not instilled in youth, then my brothers and sisters, it is very difficult very difficult to stay away from harm. The youth need to have this fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah says, وَرَاوَدَتْهُ الَّتِي هُوَ فِي بَيْتِهَا عَنْ نَفْسِهِ وَغَلَّقَتِ الْأَبْوَابِ وَقَالَتْ هَيْتَ لَكَ The woman that was looking after Yusuf alayhi salam, she was the wife of the Aziz. A financial, he was the person in charge of the finances of Egypt. She was very beautiful. She was young and she was very popular. She was rich and she had power. Yusuf السلام, on the other hand, he was extremely beautiful, extremely attractive, beyond measure. He was young, strong, and he was a slave. He was unknown. He was hardly seen. He was hidden. So, he had nothing to fear. He didn't fear about his reputation. He had no reputation. He didn't fear that people will watch him. He was not watched. He didn't fear that he will be imprisoned because the woman had power to keep him away from prison. He was inside the house. So no one was watching him. He had this woman come into the room and she locked the door and she said to him, do as you please with me. Do as you please with me. So he had the opportunity with a young woman full of power, full of richness. And there was no reputation to be worried about. He was a slave that even if people did find out that he had committed zina with Allah, no one would care. He's a slave. In fact, Imra'atul Aziz, she has more to lose because he is a slave and she is a noble woman. How would a noble woman, you know, dis, uh, seduce a slave? He had all the opportunity, brothers and sisters. More opportunity than any one of you could ever have. And in fact, he had nothing to fear. Nothing. Nothing, nothing to lose. Every opportunity to commit an act of haram. But there was only one thing which prevented him. Who knows what that is? Huh? What was it that he feared? Qala ma'ad Allah, why? What does that mean? He said, Qala ma'ad Allah. He said, I seek refuge with Allah. That was the only thing that prevented him. The fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because Allah says, وَلَقَدْ هَمَّتْ بِهِ وَهَمَّ بِهَا لَوْلَا أَرَّأَ بُرْهَانَ رَبِّهِ She wanted and desired to, to do something haram with him. And Yusuf almost desired if he had not seen the sign of his Lord. Meaning if he had not known his Lord Allah. So he was a human being. And Allah tells us, if, he didn't, if, if it wasn't that he knew his Lord and feared his Lord, 
he would have, like any other youth, fallen prey to this woman and committed zina with her. Allah says, وَهَمَّ بِهَا He desired her if only he hadn't known Allah. Meaning, he didn't desire her. It's like saying this. You know, he fell on the ground if it hadn't been for me to stop him. Did he fall? No. But I use that expression meaning that he was definitely going to fall if I wasn't there. So Allah is saying, Yusuf would have definitely been seduced and responded to it if he hadn't remembered, if he hadn't known Allah and had his fear from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So for young people, we have to entrench in their hearts from a young age, muraqabatullah, the watchfulness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is the only thing really that stops them. So Yusuf alayhi salam, he was seduced and the women of, and she even chased him. And you know the story, the women of Medina, they said, whoa, what's this? She is seducing her slave. She's gone crazy. So she brought them and she gave them fruit to cut and to eat. And then she asked Yusuf alayhi salam to come out in front of them. They thought he's a slave that looks like any other slave. But when they saw him, akbarnahu, they said, whoa, what great man he is. Akbarnahu. وَقَطَّعْنَ أَيْدِيَهُنْ And they didn't even realize that they were repeatedly cutting their hands over and over again because they were hypnotized by his looks. وَقُلْنَ حَاشَ لِلَّهِ مَا هَذَا بَشَرًا They said, whoa, glory be to God, this man is not a human being, but he is an angel. And then they noticed that they were cutting their hands with the knives. Qatta'na means they cut it repeatedly, not once, not twice, more than three times over of his beauty. Brothers and sisters, what are we compared to Yusuf alayhi salam? Allah brings him as a role model for you. He had every opportunity. And what she said was, And if he doesn't do what I am telling him, I'm going to imprison him and he's going to be humiliated. On top of that, what did Yusuf alayhi salam do? He went in the middle of the night and he called upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He cried and he said, he said, Oh my Lord, the prison, the dungeon, the darkness of the dungeon, the humiliation of the dungeon is more beloved to my heart than what they are calling me to do. Who loves the dungeon? Yusuf does not love the dungeon. But this circumstance made him love the dungeon. He had two ways out. Commit zina or dungeon. Suddenly the dungeon became his beloved. Do you understand what I'm saying? The dungeon is not a beloved of anyone. In fact, a Muslim should never wish to be in a dungeon. This is humiliation. But what is greater humiliation? Zina and hellfire? The dungeon of the, of, of the Naar, of the hellfire, or the dungeon of the dunya? The dungeon of the dunya suddenly becomes your safe haven, your beloved. Like going back to your home and sleeping in your beautiful bed in your pillow. He's more beloved to me than what they are calling me to. Allah says, his Lord responded to him. He hears all people. He is all knowledgeable. And what are we talking about? We're talking about here, like uh, a man, Yusuf a young man, he's calling upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saying, please help me my Lord. And Allah subhanahu wa is saying to him, I will help you. I will make you go into the prison. And he is saying, thank you my Lord. Which young people are like that today? He is the ideal role model. He entered the prison and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the end made him a king. If we go down that pathway, 
we become humiliated. If we lift ourselves away from that, we become kings. That's how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rewards you. So my young brothers and sisters in Islam, take a lesson from Yusuf alayhi salam and be kings. Don't be humiliated slaves. Al Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, يأتي زمان على أمتي القابض على دينه كالقابض على الجمر. There shall come a time among my ummah where the person who is grasping onto his religion is like a person grasping onto a coal from fire. This hadith is in Muslim. When you hold on to a coal of fire, is that easy or hard? It's hard. Does it burn? It burns. But you're holding on to it. Why would a person hold on to a coal of fire and burn? There's only one reason. If there is an outcome that is more valuable than a state that you are in, and if you are running away from something, Something worse than the burning of your hand. This is our time now. We have so many bombardments, trials, fitan, fitna coming from every corner. Especially to our youth. And the youth today, if they are grasping onto their deen, it's like a person grasping onto a coal from fire. Al Rasul Sallallahu went to further extents to describe this moment and he said, Zamanun fitanun ka qita'im min al layli muzlima. There will be fitan, trials and temptations. They will be so subtle, they will be so dark, like the dark clouds in a moonless night. You don't even know them and they're hitting you. It's like in the darkness. If you go outside now, it's very dark. You cannot count how many clouds there are in the sky. The fitan, the trials, the temptations that will be approaching us in this century that we are in are like the moonless night and you cannot count the clouds. They are hitting you. يُصْبِحُ الرَّجُلُ مُؤْمِنًا وَيُمْسِي كَافِرًا In the morning, they are believers. And by the night, they have become disbelievers. In the night they are believers. وَيُصْبِحُ kafira, And in the morning they have transformed to disbelievers. بَاعُوا دِينَهُمْ بِعَرَضٍ مِّنَ الدُّنْيَا They would have sold their deen for luxuries of this life. And how true this statement from the Prophet ﷺ is as if he is living among us today and watching us. We are living in a world and I can count them I'll sum them up in three words. Secularism, materialism, and capitalism. Go to Colombo. Are we in Colombo now? Okay, stay in Colombo. And just go around the corner, and you will see the most attractive buildings that stand out among all the buildings. And they are the landmark of Colombo. You know what I'm talking about? Two buildings, two towers, the World Trade Center. What do they represent? What do they represent? Huh? Capitalism, money, wealth. Go anywhere in the world, every country has the two towers. Every country has the World Trade Center. Even in the Muslim countries, everywhere. Malaysia prides itself. And when you look at it, when I sat in KL, Allahu Akbar, the twin towers shined like the way the minarets of the Haram shine. You know when you're in the airplane, you go to the Haram, to Medina or Mecca, you see it shining like a diamond pearl in the middle of the desert. That's how the twin towers shine. Billions of dollars. Why? If this is not the greatest example that we live in a world of capitalism where the strong consumes the weak, then I don't know who I am. Materialism, switch on the television, 
go on the internet, read in any book. In fact, youth don't read books anymore. And they don't even speak full sentences anymore. They don't write full sentences anymore. They write you as in the letter U. They write OMG as in oh my God. They write things like BRB, be right back. And when they speak now, and I don't know how it is in Sri Lanka, but now in the Western world in Australia, when they speak, this is how they speak. They speak in, 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 in letters. Uh, L-M-A-O. You know what I'm talking about, yeah? You know what I'm talking about. Oh. Young people. I was testing you there to see if you know what I'm talking about. Now I know. Okay, all right. Because, you know, I'm looking at all these faces... And I'm thinking, am I talking to the right audience? Do I dare talk about, you know, go deeper? So now I know, you, you know what I'm talking about, subhanAllah. The Western world, I mean, the, 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 this, this, this uh, demoralization is infiltrate, infiltrated even everywhere, you know, Sri Lanka, Saudi Arabia, everywhere. So this is what it's become. Materialism. On television, you watch a movie. Let's say you watch a halal movie, okay? A movie that is okay, inshallah. A documentary. How many commercials come during that two-hour movie? Uh, we get so annoyed by the commercials, don't we? When the commercial comes on, this day and age, wallahi, it seems that sometimes we get more attracted to the commercials than the movie that we are watching. And before you know it, like monkeys sometimes, we forget what we were watching. Because the commercials, the advertisements, and the way they make them to appeal to the young, the older than the young, the teenagers, the elderly, the men, the women, of all sorts and shapes and sizes. All shapes and sizes. I watched this commercial once about a Bedouin. A Bedouin man in the middle of the desert, away from civilization. Very smart commercial. It shows this Bedouin man wearing the attire that we wear. You know, it's represented in the Muslim world. Beard on his camel and he's got his prayer mat. He's got his dates and he's traveling in the desert. And you think, I wonder where this man is going. He travels and travels and travels. He stops and prays his salat. Then he eats his dates. Then he travels and travels. Showing a real ideal Muslim of all humbleness you think he's on a pilgrimage, like going to Mecca. Beautiful. He goes and he arrives in Mecca. He does his tawaf, religious man. You know, really representing Muslims in a beautiful way. Then he hops out of the haram, he's hungry. And then he sees a bright light, a big M. <laughs> Very smart. You know, Bedouin watches this and he'll say, Ishhad, what is this in his Bedouin, la Bedouin language? And he will become appealed to it because he's representing his culture. Very smart commercials, how they appeal. And the timing in the morning, 8 a.m., 9 a.m., just before the children are going to school, they put the best of cartoons. I don't know what you have here, but we have ABC Kids and I don't know what. And then they introduce the little commercials, little gadgets, such as that thing called Beyblades now. I don't know if you've heard of it. Beyblades, and they make a song to it, and they... I even got caught in it, subhanAllah. I didn't know what Beyblades is. Then I discovered yesterday, it represents star signs. Star signs, give it names like Virgo, and Aquarius, and I don't know what. Allahu Akbar, how subtle it was. How subtle it is. Then your child grows up a little bit more, and the commercials are catering for them, right? The best commercials for the teenagers are in the evening, 5, 6 a.m., 6 p.m., 7 p.m. We have things like Home and Away back in Australia and uh, Neighbours and uh, uh, what do you call it? These are like sitcoms, they're just all the time. And we have things like uh, Dancing with the Stars. Do you have that here? Dancing with the Stars. You, so you think you can dance. Things like uh, American Idol, Australian Idol. Do you have Sri Lankan Idol? Do you have that here? Do you know what I'm talking about? It's about young people, young people showing their talent in singing and dancing and so on. Uh, Australia's got talent. This is what we have over there. Do you have something like that in Sri Lanka? Sri Lanka has talent? 
And they bring, the point is, I mean, it doesn't matter about the name, but it's about bringing young people out there and showing their talent. It's good. It's good. Encouraging young people to show their talent. But look what happens. It shows the pop culture. It shows young girls dressed in a particular way. Young men dressed in a particular way. And the hosts who are judging them, you should see the types of things they say. I remember one of them, this student showed me. They, bro they always bring you know, two men and one celebrity woman. Or a man or whatever. But the woman is always usually attractive. She's sitting there, blonde woman. And she sees two young people come up. I think it's extreme fa factor or something like that. And they're... You know, they good, look good looking, they're young, two men, one's blonde, one's brunette, you know, men. And she asks them, how old are you? One of them says 19, the other one says 20. She says, perfect. And everybody's laughing and she's looking and she's acting cute, perfect. You know what she's talking about, right? Allahu Akbar, where's the shame? And this materialistic world. I remember in one called Australian Idol. It's about young people coming and singing, right? One man, uh, one, uh, one girl, she had a beautiful voice right in there, which, you know, uh, was a young man, he had a beautiful voice in there. And after listening to him, everybody was amazed by his voice. No music, by the way, so you don't think this, you know, your imam, I'm, I'm listening to music. He was testing the voice. So the young man is singing, and they loved his voice. They said, 10 out of 10 for your voice. But there's one problem. You've got to lose the weight. You've got to change your dress style. Your hairstyle is not right. And I'm thinking, what's that got to do with it? Then I noticed, advertising this designer clothes. They have to dress in a certain way. The next time he came around, he had his hair up like that in a bizarre style, singlet, right? Still, the, the, you know, still overweight. And after start losing weight, and they would not pass them until they had the look. They have to have the look tight clothing, revealing, the moves have to be right. All about, and excuse me for saying this, and I'm in the masjid, but about, you know, body attraction and, and the likes. Anything that ends you up in the bed. It makes our children look at this shopping. And it makes them feel that what they see on television, these gadgets, they don't just want it, they make them think that they need it. They need it. So that the children grow up with an attitude towards their parents, saying to them, it's not fair. How come my friend has a mobile phone? You go, and the father or mother says, but we bought you a mobile phone. They say, but this is an old mobile phone. My friend has got the new iPhone. I need the new iPhone. I need it. I need it. You don't care. You don't love me. You hate me. And they start to fight over these little things. And they keep bombarding us with materialism. And then the mother comes along and they begin to advertise to her and the father and so on. The world of materialism. Busying us, busying us with these little gadgets and these phony things. Then we have secularism. After World War I, young brothers and sisters, after World War I, what do you think it was about? It was about the fall of the Khilafah. It was the last of the, of the empire of Islam. And the empire of Islam united the Muslims. But unfortunately, the Muslims in positions began to become materialistic. They loved the positions, they loved the, the luxury, the money, the wealth. And this was our weakness. So we divided. And in our weakness, right at that time, they came in. And they destroyed us so easily. One of the ways they destroyed us was that they made the Turks the Turkish people who are the Ottoman Empire and the Arabs turn against each other. One of the stories says that they went to the Arabs in, the, in their lands and they said to them, how can you let Turkish people foreigners govern you and they take over the Khilafah when you are the Arabs and Muhammad وسلم, your prophet is an Arab and the Quran is Arabic. Aren't you ashamed of yourselves? They bought it. They took it. And what happened was, in one instant, the Arabs chased and had a fight with the Turks and some of them cornered them at the Kaaba in the Haram 
and Turkish people were holding on to the reins, the ropes of the Kaaba, saying, we seek refuge by Allah, and they chopped their arms off, these people who were turned away from Islam, which created a warfare and a grudge, and a, and a nationalistic grudge between the Turks and the Arabs until today, except for the religious ones, inshallah. And in Turkey, they changed it. This is where the heart of the Ottoman Empire was. They brought in secularist ideas. Among them was Ataturk. Ataturk coming in the name of nationalism, building Turkey, but with a flag, and isolating Islam. He changed the Quran from being recited in Arabic to being recited in Turkish. And the Quran was placed in the museum in glass where people looked at it so the quran became a decoration a symbol not something which you read to understand and apply but rather a symbol and truly they succeeded in that today we see young youth being uh, and even elderlies i don't know about sri lanka but over there where we you know, come from you know the young people they don't read the quran they don't know what it is you know what they do they bring the quran and they place it in their car and it's this small can't read it and it's decorated with a zip and they put it underneath the cassette recorder or the CD and in the CD it's stacked up with what Jay-Z and Ray Hanna and people like uh, Abom Abomination Gaga Lady Gaga, Google, all those other well, I don't even want to mention their names and we're in the masjid, subhanallah. These people are an abomination and they're playing it and the Quran is down there and I ask them, why do you have the Quran in your car? This is a good, good thing. And they say, oh, this is protection. Protection? Did Allah send down the Quran on paper or in words? And did Allah say, Inna anzalnahu Qur'anan Arabian. We have sent this Qur'an down Arabic so that you can just hang it up and place it in your cars? No. La'allakum ta'qilun. So that you may understand. So the Qur'an is for us to understand and apply. So this secularism came in. They changed the Adhan from Arabic to Turkish. And Muhammad became Mehmet. And Ahmed became Ahmed. And in the other worlds, Muslim worlds, like in, in the other worlds, the Arabic was lost. When the Khilafah was there, the Turkish spoke Arabic, the Arabs spoke Arabic, the Indians spoke Arabic. I don't know if the Sri Lankans existed then, but your origins, you spoke Arabic, ya akhwan. You spoke Arabic. Look at your name, subhanAllah. Three quarters of your names that I hear come from Arabic origins. The English Muslim spoke Arabic. You know Imam al-Bukhari, he wasn't an Arab. He's from Bilad Bukhara, up in Russia. Imam Muslim was not an Arab. Imam Nisa'i wasn't an Arab. They weren't Arabs. Imam Abu Hanifa, his origin was Persian. They spoke Arabic. 90% of the ulama that we know of of the past, they weren't Arabs. Yet look what they did. They took the names away. And we don't even know how to put the names together anymore. We don't know what they mean. <laughs> Secularism. Separating state from religion. To make you think, O oh youth, that you can practice your religion, that's okay. But just like every other religion, it's practiced in certain places only. Inside the mosque. Inside the church. Inside the monasteries inside the temples but outside different story and so you see really you know in essence you can see it especially among the young people they have two identities the first identity is Bilal and Fatima and the second identity is Billy and Jessica I don't know about Sri Lanka but that's how it works in Australia they have the identity Bilal with the cap an identity outside Bilal with the other cap on the side. Fatima with a hijab. 
outside Fatima I'm thinking of a brand name that rhymes with hijab I can't think of it anyway outside different story tight clothing and so on and so forth and the cap is not really yani I mentioned the cap what I mean by it, it's just a symbol the cap is not really something that is everything in Islam mainly it's the character and the uh, and the uh, and the identity but what I mean by that is the identity is changed the whole perception is changed embarrassed to show their deen as though it's just inside at work I'm another person at home I'm another person in the masjid I'm religious out in the street I'm something else so this is secularism teaching young men and women be what you want to be do what you want to do religion is a distraction religion is for the ancient minded Islam is like any other religion it's a restriction and it's sad to say wallahi with great sorrow that even some religious people make religion seem that way too we make it look like it's rules 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 do this don't do that rules punishment sin hellfire why why do we do that this is not how the Prophet ﷺ revealed Islam and I'm going to talk about that shortly inshallah my brothers and sisters in Islam for you for the youth to be on the right path we need to understand the youth number one a teenager has hormonal overdrive the hormones are all over the place number two scientifically proven the frontal lobe of the teenager has not fully developed yet do you know what the frontal lobe does the frontal lobe is responsible for reasoning decision making and solving problems in a research by the National Institute of Mental Health and University of California they said that the development of the frontal lobe occurs from the age of four years old to the age of 21 years of age so this teenager he reaches he or she reaches puberty at you know 11 12 or 13 and their bodies grow their hormones grow their temptation and lustful appetites grow but the frontal lobe responsible for analyzing reasoning and making decisions and problem solving is yet to grow so we must understand that factor in the teenagers and be tender and careful in how we teach them the teenager is very sensitive about their image their perception perception of how people think of them they want to be respected they want their views to be acknowledged and they want to be accepted by their peers girls and boys are different in their methods but the same desire is there either way they want to be respected and acknowledged they don't want to be shunned aside as if their views are insignificant they are frustrated they are frustrated because they feel that they have lack of freedom they feel that they are powerless they feel that they want to be independent girls and boys we need to understand this factor brothers and sisters before we begin to penalize them and punish them and put them down or, or anything like that this is what they want and that's why Allah made parents go through that first when we understand that then we can understand how to tackle the current culture of young the young generation let us also understand the culture of the young generation in 21st century number one popularity to them is the cool thing in anything peers are attracted to then that's what the youth want to go for so doing illegal things makes you popular prohibited things makes you gutsy so you become popular looks makes you popular sports they, you know they govern they look at and they say oh he's good at kicking a ball into the goal he's got skills so they become popular and unfortunately popular kids what do they go for they go for drugs and alcohol you know why children teenagers they get attracted by being an outlaw doing what you what normal people doing things outside the norm being gutsy unfortunately this is what they do their curiosity takes them there those who have a religion those who are in, the, in an Islamic environment they they want to have religious knowledge only to show it off 
Sometimes they want to have the religious look to say, look at me, I'm religious, popularity, i.e. showing off. Young people, they have this urge to show off if they don't know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala very well. And this influences their behavior. They expect things to be handed to them without working for it. This is the current youth culture. Parents are considered old-minded or outdated. So they don't fit into the equation. You know, in Australia is what they say. They call mum old cheese. Old cheese. Dad, you're old man. Subhanallah. Ibrahim used to address his father as abati. Now they address him as old man. And there are cartoons such as The Simpsons and the likes. You heard of The Simpsons? It's a very uh, attractive cartoon. You know, even I, when, I was, uh, when it first came out, I liked it. You know, it's attractive. But in a very subtle way, you have a young boy who is meant to be uh, rebellious. And the father is a dum dum. Dummy. The mother, she's the one with all the brains and she's in control. She resolves all the problems. The girl, oof, she's got a mind of her own, atheist, questions everything, you know, mentally. And it tells young boys to be like Bart Simpson, young girls to be like Lisa. And fathers, well, we just feel sorry for them. They're just cuddly big bears. And mothers are the rulers. And really, it really portrays the Western world, honestly. We have the current culture where cyber technology is the means of communication. Young people don't know how to communicate anymore. Using time for beneficial work is a waste of time. But for desires, it is utilizing time. Relationships. Friends come before family. Intimate relationships, they've resorted to girlfriend and boyfriend, homosexuality, marriage not on their minds. Marriage is for older people. Have fun when you're young and let it all out. Go to Hajj when you're old. Pray when you're old. If school got a whole life to live. Their role models are celebrities based on their sporting skills they choose the role model. Based on their singing abilities, they choose their role models. Based on their dancing skills, they can move. They're the role models. Based on their acting skills, role models. Based on good looks, based on the image, and some of them based on gangsters. That's their role models. We have in Australia a lot of this gangster stuff. Die by the, live by the gun and die by the gun. What is Muslim culture today? It's double identity. Don't know which one to go for. And what is shaping all this behavior, brothers and sisters, in Islam? The education system is one of them. You know, we get proud of our children getting high marks. But what are they getting high marks in? Knowledge that is beneficial or knowledge which is corrupting their minds? Let us look at the knowledge and education which they're getting rather than how much marks and what grades they got, which is the most important thing. Brothers and sisters in Islam, our youth today, and I'm speaking to the youth now, we used to say, oh, my son or my daughter, they're at home, alhamdulillah. If they're outside, we get worried, where are they? This day and age, this day and age, they sit inside their bedroom, and we don't know, the whole world is in front of them. And now we prefer them for them to go out, rather than stay in. They're being corrupted in their own bedroom more than what they are corrupted outside. I had a, once a, a, a young sister coming knocking on my door at 2 a.m. in the middle of the night and she was overdosed on some pills. She had cut her wrists and I thought, subhanAllah, what happened? And she had a big, big problem. I, I, I don't want to mention it here in the masjid, but it's a very shameful problem. And she said, I looked everywhere for help and I couldn't find help. So I looked at the internet and I found a solution on an R&B website. R&B, rhythm and beat, music, music website. 
and he was telling me don't worry what you feel is normal just you need to adjust to it and there are many people like you we are talking about this type of relationship like Qawmulut so we spoke to her alhamdulillah but unfortunately they are finding their role models and places in the wrong places the internet world and Facebook is a problem it can be used for good but it can also be used for evil unfortunately and sadly youth my dear brothers and sisters Facebook has become the most uh, popular thing for you I call it rubbish book why because the majority of youth unfortunately are using it for rubbish how can a person be happy to have their photo on Facebook for the whole world to see I mean would you come up with your personal photo to show everybody here in this masjid sisters and brothers and then they say to me but it's a private you know we've got like this private place we only choose who can see it and who can't you are being deceived don't be silly did you know that everything that goes on the net is never ever ever erased and it is there so long as technology exists you'll die and you're still there do you know how many marriages have been cut off have been destroyed because of Facebook using it in the wrong means how many bullies have resulted from it in schools you find that there are friends in the school they're talking to each other normal right they're friends overnight they come back and they want to kill each other why something happened over Facebook gossip and backbiting and suddenly it's everywhere Facebook or MSN or I don't know what use it use it for Islam use it for good but don't use it for bad unfortunately people are using it for that did you know that there is a new world order I'm not talking about conspiracy theories here but the world is changing and now they're, they're, they're hijacking and stealing your identity did you know that brothers and sisters they're stealing your identity and now even in the Apple iPhones they've got this new thing called iCloud heard of iCloud you're the IT people where is Riaz you know brother tell us you can teach us iCloud it carries all your personal information is thing bubble called a cloud everybody can access it it's there like a cloud for everybody to know and soon I heard that they're going to you know bring uh, currency and finance the way you tra your transactions are through it's going to be compulsory back in Australia to use the credit card system you know so that your your wealth and your assets are in numbers on the computer screen Rasul sallallahu and his sahabas knew that this day would come and they held their identity very very firmly Mus'ab ibn Umayr radiallahu anhu had a brother and in after the battle of Badr his brother was a kafir and another sahabi he had tied him he had tied him with the ropes he was a captive and his brother said to Mus'ab, seeing him walking, he said, Brother, please, please help me, get me out of this. So then Mus'ab ibn Umayr looked at the Sahabi. He said to him, Tighten the ropes on him. And the other brother, the brother said, Is this what blood reaches us to? He said, Today, that man is more my brother than you. And he is from his own family. Why am I saying this? This person was out there to kill Ar Rasul Sallallahu and fight Mus'ab ibn Umayr and fight the Muslims. But Mus'ab ibn Umayr understood his identity, what it is. His identity is that he is a Muslim of Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala. Today, this order of the world that's trying to pull these people into this uh, trick, the biggest hardship which they are going through are the Muslims. Why? Because Muslims stay away from things such as interest and riba. Riba. Did you know that countries of the world, Muslim countries of the world, they are, their people are governed by rulers who are oppressive to them. You know why they're oppressive? Because they have become puppets to the Western world, to America and the likes. And why have they become puppets? Because they are chained up. Not by real chains. Do you know what the chains are? They are debt. They are indebted. They busied us with fighting each other. Do you remember when Kosovo was happening in Bosnia? 
when the Muslims were being massacred, Muslim sisters, youth were being raped and killed. Muslim women who were pregnant, they were ripped open and the children were taken out before their brothers and their fathers. Fathers were forced to rape their own daughters. And the brothers and sons had to watch. Where was the Muslim world? Where was the Muslim world at that time? You know what they were? They were busy in Iraq fighting Iran. Even though their common enemy is Israel. But they were fighting each other. Warfare. Where was, where were we? Did we not know about this fight between Kosovo? For Muslims massacred in the thousands and millions. More than what they talk about in relation to uh, the, the genocide of what they, the, 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 uh, the Jewish genocide that they talk about. Where are they? the Palestinians massacred in the thousands every day? And where is the Muslim world? We are busied. Our youth are asleep. And I don't blame them for being asleep. This infiltration of what is happening now is making us go to sleep. The only way out, my brothers and sisters, is to stick to your identity of Islam. The Sahabas left everything, everything, in order to stick to the identity and make hijrah with the Prophet ﷺ. Until the point where the Prophet ﷺ said to them, you will rule the Romans, Byzantines. You will take over Persia. And the Muslims truly did. And they reached places like China in the time of Umar radiallahu anhu. Among youth. Why? Because they stuck to their identity. Their role model was Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You know, when I was, people ask me, when you were a teenager at high school, I went to secular schools you know, in Australia. Was I a religious person or not? Alhamdulillah I was. But it was very difficult. It was very difficult. You know, it's not that easy. You have to be challenged. I went in year 7 and year 8 and the students who were there, they bullied me. They bullied me because I was talking about Islam. I talked about Islam all the time. The people who hurt me the most were not the non-Muslim ones. The ones who hurt me the most were the Muslim friends. I used to be friends with them in primary, but there was no Islamic schools in high school. When we went in, they couldn't identify themselves as Muslims. And when I came around, they avoided me. And they even made fun of me. Wallahi, I went through misery. As a young child, it's like a, a prison, but without the lethal side of it. Teenagers, they go through a lot, man. Wallahi, I, I, feel, I, feel, remor I, I feel sorry for them sometimes, because they go through a very big hardship. As a teacher, I counsel them every day. It's very difficult for them what they go through. What kept me on the straight, what kept me strong was one thing. My father, he used to teach me so much about the Sahabas of the Prophet ﷺ. And I used to remember them, that what they went through. I used to remember Khubayb and Khabbab ibn al-Arat radiallahu anhu. Khabbab ibn al-Arat radiallahu anhu. He was captured by Abu Sufyan when he was still a kafir. And he was tied to a pole, to a tree. And he began to say to him, Ya Khabbab, if you say one word, I will let you go. I'm almost done, inshaAllah. He said, Khabbab, if you say, if you just say, I wish that Muhammad وسلم, was here in my place and I was with my family comfortable at home, I will let you free. Just say it. And Khabbab said to him, I wish that I will be tortured here and not to even hear that Muhammad وسلم, is hurt with a prick of a needle. So he cut off his right arm. He repeated it to him again and Khabbab repeated the same thing. They cut off his left arm. He repeated the same thing until he cut off his legs, then his nose, then his eyes, then his ears. And in the end, he stabbed him. Then Abu Sufyan looked around and he said, by God, I have never seen people who love their master as much as what this youth loves their master, their prophet. What kind of love is this? Or like that other youth who was a memorizer of the Quran and Musaylam al kadhab he came to him and he put him to the ground with the sword, tied him up and cut off his arms. And he said to him, do you bear witness that Muhammad is a messenger of God? 
وسلم, he said, yes. He said, do you bear witness that I am a messenger of God? He said, uh, there's a ringing in my ear. So he kept cutting him up, cutting him up. And he would continue saying, there's a ringing in my ear. There's a ringing in my ear until he died. Saying, Muhammad is messenger of Allah and there's a ringing in my ear in relation to you. They stood firm with their identity. And they are our greatest role models. Allah has left them. If I ask the youth, how many celebrities do you know? MashaAllah, they count a hundred just by sitting there. How many Sahabas do you know? They'll count a few by name, but do you know their stories very well? Read about them, my brothers and sisters. Wallahi, they are something beyond this world. Something beyond this world. There is a culture among the youth which I fear, and that is that they are turning away from marriage, and if they get married, they divorce very quickly. Brothers and sisters in Islam, do not let the idea of haram relationships get the better of you. A lot of youth, they come to me and they say, Brother, I want to get married, but I need, to, I need to get to know the girl. And the girl says, I need to get to know the guy. How am I meant to get to know them if I don't go out with them? If we don't have coffee together? If we don't, I like the West teachers, go out together. Brothers and sisters, let me inform you about something very important. You will never know your future wife or your future husband if you just go out together. You'll never know them. Take it from a person who's lived in a, in a country where people do this all the time. Because when you go out together, you are on your best behavior. You are on your best looks, the best cologne. The CK perfume is on you. And she's got Versace. And she's come out ready to meet you. She's probably looked at the, at the mirror and spent about half an hour practicing how to talk to you. And you as well, looking at every little hair on your forehead, every little hair on your cheek. This all fades away within about six months of your marriage. The only thing that's left is the character. You will never know the true character of this person until you meet them in their home. You go the Islamic way and you go and ask for their hand in marriage to their father first. A lot of youth, they come to me and they say, I need to get to know the, the girl first. And subhanAllah, how quick they are to jump on where? Where do they jump on to get to know them? Right here. The internet. And messaging, text. They start conversing. Are you interested in marriage? She's on the other side. She's got a username first, right? I'm sorry, I'm a brother. Okay, shop for another one. Click, click. Are you interested in marriage? Or maybe just subtly. Let's chat. Comes and says, yes, I'm a sister. How did you know I was a sister? Oh, you know, I looked at your profile and you had some really good... I mean, I'm interested in that too. And they, and they just get into this conversation. And he comes up to me and says, brother, brother, it's in, the, it's, it's in the interest of marriage. You know, my intentions are pure. Your intentions are pure? You're doing this for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? But you're doing it your way? What do you think? You're making up your own religion now. So they chit-chat and they chit-chat and they chit-chat, right? First they attract each other. Then they meet each other. Then they look at each other. It's all good to know, right? They haven't touched. Then they want to touch. Then the touch turns into something else. And then finally, they fall in love. In love. Oh, if you only knew. Brothers and sisters, you don't know what love is. This is not love. This is lust, lust. In the West, this is what happens. Boyfriend, girlfriend, walking. The girl is thinking, oh, how romantic he is. He's like uh, that movie I watched the other day, Twilight Saga. <laughs> the boy, he thinks he's Rambo. Walking, you know, tensing his muscles. She's thinking how romantic he is, walking me through the garden and the roses and the butterflies. He's got one thing on his mind. And he's thinking, I will tolerate all of this until I get to what I want. And you come to him, if he's a Muslim, you ask him about his sister, he will say, I'll kill any guy who looks at her. I see that. Speak to my students. In the playground, at lunchtime, they're sitting on benches with girls talking, and the girl's wearing her hijab, and she's playing with her hijab with her finger, like this, and chewing a gum. What are you talking about? Are oh, we talking about studies? They are, they're talking about physics, but she's doing this. 
MC square, M equals C, uh, what is it? Something. Okay? You know the Py Pythagoras theorem. A, A squared plus B squared equals C squared, and she's playing like this. And the boy is sitting like this. No, 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 you see, A squared plus B, and I, I, can, I can solve it for you. Let me show you. You want to study? Why don't you study with the boy? Girl, sister, why don't you study with the sister? Now, I know in Sri Lanka you have segregated schools. I know that. I know. But I'm just telling you that when, the, when they come together, this is what happens. Youth. If you want to marry someone, then you go in the right way, inshallah. Go through her father first, before you go through the girl. Why? The fathers, my sisters, I'm talking to you now. Sisters, you've never been a man before. You don't understand how men think. Let your father do the work, inshallah. And obviously the fathers, I encourage you to be a bit more courageous and find husbands for your daughters. Don't sit there and, you know, make it difficult. The Sahabas, they used to make the halal easy. So what became hard? The haram. When we make the halal hard, the haram becomes easy. Mark my words, brothers and sisters. I'm talking to the parents. When you make the halal hard, the haram becomes easy. When you make the halal easy, the haram becomes hard. Open the doors for marriage, inshallah, and lower the dowry, and go in accordance with the Quran and the Sunnah. So the brother comes to the father, and the father likes him. Then you meet the daughter, and if you fall in love with her, alhamdulillah. But the other way, if you fall in love with each other, you come to ask for her hand in marriage, and then the father says, over my dead body. <laughs> what are you going to do then? You've fallen for each other. What are you going to do? Hmm? The boy is dreaming about her. She's dreaming about him. He's the love of her life. She's the love of his life. That's what the shaitan tells you. What are you going to do? They start to cry. They start to this. They want to commit suicide. They ah. So they elope. They run away together. I'll tell you something else. If he is a brother who fears Allah, don't, don't, wallah, if you fear Allah, that's good. But if you put yourself in this position, wallahi, you will fall into haram as well. You can't control yourself, ya akhi. So you fall in love with her, and you've already sent messages and probably even images that are haram. And you feel so guilty. And you don't want to marry this girl anymore. Let's say you don't want to marry her anymore. But now you feel obliged because you wouldn't want your sisters to be in that situation. So you say, man, I have to marry her now because I've gone too far. I feel guilty. I can't just let her go because I've gone too far. I've used her. So he goes and marries her for two months to get the guilt away. That's what happens, my sisters. And that's one of the reasons why divorces happen. He doesn't want you anymore, but he feels the guilt. So he marries you and then he lets you go. In Australia, there are brothers who get married and they want to marry a second wife. In culture, you know, in Arab culture, for example, marrying a second wife, it's difficult. So what do they do? They go for converts to Islam. They marry them two months, three months down the track, and then they divorce them. This is haram. Haram to use and abuse. There are married couples who are stricken by this internet business and Facebook. And the, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you this halal for you at home. And there are sisters who Allah has given you this halal man at home. But for some reason, curiosity gets the better of you and you go to search the world. And divorces occur as a result. Fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. My brothers and sisters, you are only putting yourselves into harm. And our children are being neglected. Our children are being taken away by others. Walayyadu billah. And they are being raised by other people. While the husband and wife are too busy with their desires. Some of them, yani. My brothers and sisters, I end it with uh, a few advices to all of us who want to advise young people. I remind you to advise them with care and patience. Never stop communicating with your children. Our teenagers, when they reach adolescent, boy or girl, 
If they don't have good communication with their parents, they will hide a lot of things from you. And they need role models and guides. If you, don't, if you stop communicating, then they will keep their secrets away from you and they'll tell it to someone else who will give them wrong guidance. I asked a brother one day, a colleague of mine, his, his children, mashallah, very healthy in communication. I said, how did you manage this? He said, I never stopped talking to them. Like even if they're sitting watching TV, I sit with them, halal, something halal. I sit down and I talk to them. I say, so what happened here? Oh, and this is what happened? You know, I like that. And talking like as if they're their age. So never stop communicating with your teenagers, my brothers and sisters. Secondly, listen to them. Give them the opportunity to speak and explain themselves, especially when they've done the wrong thing. Don't punish them very quick. Give them an opportunity to speak and explain. A hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to do that with his Sahabas. Point out the reasons why something is right and why something is wrong before you punish your children, especially if they're teenagers. Point it out. Tell them why this is right and why this is wrong. And don't just say, Allah said so. Explain to them and try and tell them from your experience. My father used to, we used to have a butcher. And my father used to take me out, me and my brother, to deliver meat to the different restaurants. And deliberately he used to make us pass by certain streets which had corrupted people there. You know, women who used to stand who looked like men. You know what I'm talking about. And we used to see the drunk people. We used to see the drunk men under cars. I remember once seeing a man under a car with his leg outside. And everybody's walking up and down, not caring about him. I remember seeing young girls there drunk and, and men are just pulling them this way and that way. I remember seeing an old woman, the age of my grandmother. She's drunk and she's talking and she had urinated it. And, and, and people are looking at it. And I, as, as, a, as a child, when I was 11 years old, I got afraid of that. And my father used to say, son, this is the reason why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells you don't drink alcohol. This is the reason why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells you don't have girlfriends and boyfriends. This is the reason why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells you stay away from nightclubs and, and music and, and this and that. Look what will happen to you. And subhanAllah, it developed a sense of fear in my mind. When I became a teenager, yes, I won't lie to you. I had temptations and the shaitan gave me these urges. And there are opportunities which the shaitan brings to you, boys and girls. But what made me afraid is that. The consequence of things. So when, you, when they understand the reasons behind it, they know, they, they appreciate what you tell them. Rasul Sallallahu said, teach your children salat at the age of seven and punish them at the age of ten. Salat is the most important factor among the teenagers. And I'm talking to the youth here. Salat teaches you discipline. Salat teaches you relationship with Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. Everything else doesn't matter if you don't have salat. Salah is your main communication with Allah, my dear brothers and sisters in Islam. Pray your five daily prayers and make it your food that you eat. Make it the drink that you drink, my dear brothers and sisters. If you love a friend, don't you communicate with them? Communicate with Allah if you love Him. And die on salat, insha'Allah. Silah is your communication with Allah. Without it, wallahi, you'll be nothing. Salah reminds, Salah reminds you of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I've never seen someone who prays five times a day in prison for crimes. When I visit the prison, I ask, did you used to pray? Often they will say, Wallahi, I never used to pray, man. And they go on drugs and they go on this and on that. A Salah is your protection, my brothers and sisters in Islam. Make it the food and drink. Put it between your eyes. And make it your priority. Our Rasul sallallahu alaihi wasallam taught the Bedouin who entered the masjid and urinated in the corner of the masjid. Remember, before the Sahabas drew their swords and they wanted to kill him. Our Rasul sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, "No, no, no! Let him finish! Let him finish! Let him finish his urination because then it will harm his bladder." After he finished, he said, "Bring some water and, and just wash it away." And he called the Bedouin in front of him away from everybody so he doesn't embarrass him he said my brother with the most beautiful words urination is normal everybody needs to do you know call used to respond to the call of nature but this is not the correct place for this act it's just telling him in a very 
The better one said, Allah, bi abi huwa wa ummi. Wallahi, I would sacrifice myself for him before my mother and father. How gentle and beautiful his explanation was. Urinating in them, imagine that happened here. Would kill him. Woof. I remember once in the masjid back in Melbourne, a brother, he, uh, he prayed while his glasses were on. He kept his glasses on. An old man looked at him and he started saying, how can you pray without your with your glasses on? How can you concentrate on your prayer? Start reprimanding him. Then another old man from the side, he said, take it easy, take it easy. He said, son, you know, take it off when you go to sujood so you can make sujood. The, old, the older, other elderly, I thought he had wisdom. And the young person had wisdom too. You know what he said to him? He didn't say, oh, how bad your attitude is. He said, subhanallah, how, how silly I am. Why didn't I think of that myself? He took off his glasses and put it here. Even though he disagreed with what the old man said. So have this reasoning, inshallah. Take care with the teenagers and be calm with them and explain to them with wisdom. And don't tell them off in front of other people. Imam Shafi'i says, advising someone in front of others is exposing them. So advise them in secret alone. And I hate, Imam Shafi'i used to say, I, would, I hate people advising me in public. This is Imam Shafi'i saying that. So imagine our teenagers who are still yet developing their frontal lobes. Take it easy if they didn't listen to you immediately the first time. Mother and father, they say, brush your teeth. They're still watching TV. They're still asleep. Didn't I tell you to brush your teeth? Son, help me take the rubbish out. They don't go straight away. Didn't I tell you to take the rubbish out? Ah, oh, what am I going to do with you? Uh, you know, come to their husbands. We've got a problem. Our son, our daughter, they're not listening, man. They're not listening from the first time. We have a problem. Take it easy. It's okay. Listen to this beautiful hadith. Zayd radiallahu anhu, he was a young teenager, probably about 14, 15, maybe 13, 12. Our Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa told him, can you go and get me such a thing? He said, yes, ya Rasulallah. He exited. Then the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa noticed that he was late. He went outside and he saw Zayd playing with the children. Oh, actually, he was standing and watching the children playing. Like that. Ar Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi what do you think he did? He said to him, Ya Zayd. And Zayd looked at the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Rasul was laughing. He was laughing. He said, Did you forget what I told you to do? <laughs> you forgot, didn't you? And Zayd looked at him and put his head down. And he said, I'm going now. I'm going now. I want you to notice something here. Ar Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is laughing at Zayd. It's like, Look, Zaid, if you didn't go yet, it's no big deal. And look, Zaid, I understand what you're doing. You, you like the playing around with the kids. If I was your age, I'd be the same thing. You know, and I like it to play. Like, as if he's telling him, look, what you're doing, playing with the kids is no problem. But just come and play after you've finished what, what you have to do. And come back and play, because playing is good. And he's laughing and saying, I understand what you're going through. I want you to imagine what would go through Zaid's head. As he grows up, he's going to look at Rasul Sallallahu and think, it's easy to communicate with him. I'm going to come to him and tell him my secrets when I'm, I have a problem. He understands me. So I'm going to talk to him. That's what happens with your children. So if they don't listen, laugh it off and say subhanallah. If they make a mistake or an accident, don't jump onto them quickly and call them names and insult them. Once Zaid, he broke a plate. And the Prophet's wives, you know, they talk negatively towards him. They said something. Ar Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam interfered immediately and he said, What's wrong? What's wrong? What's wrong? He looked at the plate, looked at Zayd. Zayd was afraid and he said, Don't worry, don't worry. The qada and qadar is even upon the plates as well. The plate has a time. It's time to die was now. Come, and he cleaned it up. It was easy. What happens then? Subhanallah. Again, this is the, the comfort and the way we raise them. Some of us, what do we do to our children if they make a mistake? Gosh, you're such a butterfingers. You've always been a butterfingers. When are you going to learn? Watch it. Silly, stupid. These are words which should never be called because if you call them these names, they become those names. And lastly, Abu Darda radiallahu anhu, his method was like this. And I finish with this beautiful story. He went, he was walking, and then he found a people near a well. And they were calling this man bad names because the man had done a bad sin. Then Abu Darda came up to them and, they, and he said to them, 
if he fell in a well, would you pick him up and try to save him? They said, yes. He said, well, he's fallen into a sin. Pick him up and save him from the sin. Don't call him names and insult him. And then they looked at Abu Darda and said, but don't you hate him? Look what he's done. He's done a major sin. Don't you hate him for that? Abu Darda says, I hate the action which he has done. But as for him, he is my brother. He brought him and he talked to him and advised him in a beautiful way. That man repented to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and later became one of the figures among the Sahabas. This is how we advise. Have a balanced approach, my dear brothers and sisters, towards our teenagers and let them be role models and leaders of Islam, insha'Allah. My final advice, my brothers and sisters, the young youth, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala preserve you. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala strengthen you. In this country, Sri Lanka, you have a lot of work to do, insha'Allah. Don't exhaust yourself. Alhamdulillah, if you're a religious person, don't overdo it. Don't feel that you have to, you know, pray night prayer every time, for example. Pray it, but start off slow, once a month maybe. Don't feel that you have to memorize the Quran in, in, in just, you know, in a month or so. Or a year. If, 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 it, if, it, if you can, memorize it quickly, inshallah, give yourself time, but work in balance with yourself. If you can, mashallah, excellent. If you can't and you feel frustrated, explain this to your parents and work with it at ease. And parents give them that opportunity. At the end of the day, we want them to memorize the Quran, insha'Allah. It's not how quick it is, it's the quality that we want in, at the end of the day. My son, wallahi, if he memorizes even two ayat a day, five ayat a day, memorizes 30 ayat, I'm happy. If he memorizes one ayat a day, alhamdulillah, at least he did something. My brothers and sisters, young people, don't overexhaust yourself to the point where if you do so much good, then pff, you lose energy and you get worse than what you were. Doing something good and then stopping it is worse than not doing that extra and staying balanced throughout your way. Lots of good deeds and going back to less is worse than doing minimum good deeds but consistently. Brothers and sisters in Islam, use your skills and don't think that everybody has to learn Islamic education. Everyone has to know this, the fundamentals of Islam, all of us. But none of you, not all of you have to become scholars. Some become scholars, some become some other things. Don't think that what we call it secular education, mathematics and engineering, all of that stuff. This is good. Learn it, but use it and see how you can use it into Islam. Imam Shafi'i, he was an encyclopedist. He was an uh, astronomist. Uh, he was an expert in medicine. He was an expert in poetry and many other things other than a scholar. And he used to say, the ummah left a large portion of this deen, which is medicine. And the Quran speaks about aquatic life, about astronomy, about uh, uh, psychology, about medicine, about all these things. So if that's your area, go for it. Imam Malik's son, Imam Malik's son, he didn't become a scholar. And Imam Malik used to say to him, come and learn, come and learn. And he would say, no, no, I don't want it, I don't want it. He learned the basics. And Imam Malik said, subhanallah, who, may, who did not make knowledge an inheritance. And this tells us that, look, let your children go into an area that they enjoy, but just make sure that what they go into is halal within Islamic limits and see how you can use it. We need IT professionals, we need graphic designers, we need people in the media, we need people who represent us in all these ways. If everybody became a alim and a scholar, really, I mean, we live in a world, whether you like it or not, technology is advancing and we live in a world of marketing, we live in a world where we need to know all those other areas. Like Salman al-Farisi, he taught the Muslims how to build a trench. The Muslims never knew this idea, but he brought it from the Persian world. And because of that, Allah brought victory to the Muslims out of that. That's why we, the Muslims reached Persia after that. Technology is, 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 is excellent to learn, but use it in the course of Islam. Don't become doctors and all of that stuff and engineers and accountants and, and uh, technicians and even plumbing, electrician or whatever you may become. It's all excellent, mashaAllah. But don't become these things and then isolate yourself from the community. We want to benefit. Allah gives you something, give back. Give back, my brothers and sisters. How wonderful it would be when I heard that lots of Muslims here have got organizations and businesses which they've established themselves and we don't need to go anywhere else. We find our employment with each other. That's what the Jews do. That's why they're successful in that. Employ each other and, live and let us grow ourselves from it within each other, inshallah, and then benefit other people. Brothers and sisters, your temptations and your desires. Wallahi, I'm an advocate. 
of people getting married at a young age. And brothers and sisters, the elderly, I encourage you to help. If you have the financial means and support, support your, your, your children to get married at a young age. Don't be afraid. Even if they're still at university. Yani at least get them engaged in first year. It, wallahi, it helps. At, at, in the end, it saves them from a lot of things. I'm really an advocate of that. Give them the support. I mean, I was still at the university when I was married. I was finishing my final year. It helped me focus much more. It helped me focus much more. Uh, my young brothers and sisters, do not resort to, the, to the, uh, the secularist Western ways of relationships. This is not the right way. It only causes you harm. Brothers and sisters, your Islam and your deen is the greatest asset that you have. And the Sahabas are the greatest role models that you can ever have. Use them as your role models and work with them. Every single Sahaba has a particular example and lesson that you can learn from. You will find it. I'll give you a name, Tha'laba radiallahu anhu. Another name, Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu anhu. Another name, Abdullah ibn Abbas, Abu Ubaid ibn al-Jarrah. Give you another name, uh, Suhail radiallahu anhu. For the sisters, I've given you many names which I mentioned before as well. Learn from them and use them as your role models. Inshallah, you'll feel really good about yourself. It'll give you much encouragement, inshallah ta'ala. As a young man, insha'Allah, myself, I consider myself a youth still. It is, was my pleasure and my honor to speak to young people and also to elderly. It was my pleasure and my honor to be here in Sri Lanka, this wonderful country. And my perception has become even better than what it was before. I have a lot to go back to Australia and tell the people about. I am impressed very much, alhamdulillah, and feel proud that you have a strong board, a collective board of great scholars and imams who help guide you in your affairs of life. And I've met some of them and I have privileged to have sat with them. Use them as your guide, inshallah. I am privileged to have met lots of religious people, many young people who are memorizing the Quran, mashallah. And I can see many faces that inshallah will become one of those. My advice to you, however, is don't just memorize the Quran without knowing its meaning, try to also learn its meaning and practice it, uh, insha'Allah, and that will complete your virtue, bi'idnihi ta'ala. Be dutiful towards your parents, my dear brothers and sisters in Islam, and you will have a longer life, a happier life, and you will feel proud, and you will get married, insha'Allah, and feel happy in your marriage, and your children will be as well. Elderlies, please, my brothers and sisters, take this advice, insha'Allah, from me as your son, insha'Allah, because I lived through this and I want to remind you that you also lived through this your children living through it now talk to them subtly and young brothers and sisters talk to your parents don't think they're older an older generation they know what you've been through and let them explain your thoughts and don't be embarrassed if you have any questions and you feel embarrassed ask the ulama email me if you want email other scholars around the world talk don't let it stay inside of you and let it eat you away Talk, ask questions, insha'Allah, and relieve yourself from it, insha'Allah. There is no aib in halal. In halal, meaning if you want to seek knowledge, there's no such thing as being embarrassed of it. Don't be embarrassed, but ask with adab, insha'Allah ta'ala. Finally, I'd like to make a, a dua for my brothers and sisters in, Shri, in, in Sri Lanka. So please say ameen. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wa salatu wa salamu ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'een. اللهم صل على نبيك وعلى آله ومن تبعه بإحسان إلى يوم الدين اللهم إني أسألك بأسمائك الحسن وبصفاتك العلى أسألك بكل اسم هو لك سميت به نفسك أو أنزلته في كتابك أو علمته أحدا من خلقك أو استأثرت به في علم الغيب عندك أن تنفع شبابنا وشاباتنا بما يرضيك اللهم رد شاباتنا وشبابنا إلى دينك مردا جميلا اللهم وحد قلوبنا يا أرحم الراحمين اللهم ردنا إلى دينك مردا جميلا اللهم لا تدع في مقامنا هذا ذنبا إلا غفرته ولا دينا إلا قضيته ولا مريضا إلا شفيته ولا معسرا إلا يسرته ولا أسيرا إلا فككت أسره ولا ضالا إلا هديته 
اللهم ولا مجاهدا إلا نصرته اللهم اغفر لنا وارحمنا يا أرحم الراحمين اللهم وحد بين قلوب أصحابي اللهم وحد بين قلوب أهل سريلانكا اللهم وقوهم اللهم وانفعهم اللهم واجعل لهم الإيمان قيما مستقيما في حياتهم اللهم يا ربنا وآت نفوسهم تقواها وزكهم أنت خير من زكاها أنت وليها ومولاها اللهم علمهم يا رب العالمين وأرشدهم يا مرشد ويا كريم وآتهم الحكمة يا أحكم يا أحكم الحاكمين اللهم اللهم وانفع بهم الأمة اللهم وقو بهم الأمة اللهم وانفع بهم اللهم وانفع بهم الأمة اللهم من أحييته منهم فأحيه على الإيمان ومن توفيتهم منهم فتوفهم على الإيمان My brothers and sisters in Islam say Ameen I've made a great dua for you in every way I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to strengthen your hearts and minds to forgive your sins to give you his mercy to guide the young ones among our brothers and our sisters to make you leaders for those non-Muslims and for the Muslims I asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to cure the sick among us tonight to forgive the ones who have sins who have sinned to guide the young ones and the old and the elderly ones I asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to not leave out anyone who is in hardship except to relieve them from anyone who is in debt to take care of their debt for anyone who is lost to guide them back to the right path I had asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to endure you with great knowledge that is beneficial which you can benefit yourselves your family your community and the non-muslims as well I asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to, to grant you and gift you with great character so that you may be of the among the greatest of the du'at for this generation and the next to come I asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless you and to bless your families and to bless your provision and your homes I asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to fill the people of Sri Lanka with his blessings and with his kindness Amin ya rabbil alameen هذا وصلى الله على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين وآخر دعوانا أن الحمد لله رب العالمين. I hope to see you again إن شاء الله if Allah سبحانه وتعالى wills it. Brothers and sisters, I'm sorry if I didn't answer some of your calls. ما شاء الله I received so many. The best way to communicate with me is through emails. And please not just myself. You had Mufti Menkia, ما شاء الله. You had Brother Sulaiman Mulla. You had many others who came along. Email them, communicate with them. They are, mashaAllah, endured with so much experience. And I've spoken to Mufti Menk yesterday. And you can tell, mashaAllah, that he really understands the youth. He really understands the community. And he's very open-minded. I advise you also to be open-minded. Open-minded. Islam is simpler and easier and more open and flexible than what we think. So look into Islam, inshaAllah, and take that as that. Then let it be a burden. Rather, be it, let it be a relief for you, inshaAllah ta'ala. Email me, inshaAllah, Brother Azad. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward him and Brother Riyaz and the backbone youth, mashaAllah, how many they were. I think they amounted to now 30 who have uh, contributed in my presence being here with the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I really thank them. Uh, I thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and then thank them for their hospitality. And I thank you all for your hospitality. Uh, I've never really come across people more generous than you really so far and more hospitable than your hospitality and more humble than your humbleness, mashaAllah ta'ala. The smiles are everywhere. Even among the non-Muslims of the Sri Lankans, to be honest with you, mashaAllah. Yani I couldn't believe even my shoes are being brought to me. I'm overwhelmed by this. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward you and keep you in your health and iman. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.